Can you see the grape juice bottle that's on that back table? Because apparently my children did not clear no. the table from dinner. You have the no. fuzzy. You have a fuzzy background. Okay, good. Yeah. I didn't do that on purpose, so that's just serendipitous. It's automatic. Okay, yay. Because yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Is it my right. time? Fuzzy? Just a second. What? Let me fuzzify mine. You're gonna fuzzify yours? I guess yeah. I can fuzzify. How mine. do you fuzzify? I don't. I didn't even. I don't. I mean, that was just on its own. I'm fuzzified. It's it's default, but okay. yours is and Travis is now, so we're now we're all fuzzified. Okay. Nice. I like fuzzified. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you ready to dive in? Let's dive, dive. Yeah, dive. I did the I did the no cat. I don't want you go away. Wow. I did. Um... This. <laughs> <laughs> is it enough? I don't, I was. It was. Well, rushed. I also Sorry. I also have my notes. So okay, yeah. good. Yeah, we got plenty to work with, and my memory. I guess we'll go. Memory, Agent Starling, is what I have instead of a view. <laughs> and I have the book right here. Oh okay. man, short. Oh, you know potent. this this uh, book, this version of the book. I really liked this. It's not. It's just a. The top of the chapter for the Bridge to the Stars has just a nice pencil sketch of Lyra that I really like. Oh, isn't that nice? That nice. Aww. Each one, some of them don't have any, but that one I thought was very nice. Now I want to get that one and uh, embroider it on a hat. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the cover is great, too. It has the um, Ursa Major uh, mm -hmm. bear, and it's the golden... Did you see the alethiometer is square in the new, new movie? Yeah. Or the new show? Well, the, the, the cases, the lithiometer is still round, but it's like a mm. square thing. It's like an Apple Watch. Yeah, it's like an <laughs> Apple Watch. That would be, uh, can you imagine if they went there with that and made it like digital? You know, there's an app. There's, <laughs> I, I found an lithiometer app. Did you really? I did. You need to, we need to link to that. I'll link to it. Thing. I'll, I'll yeah. send you guys the link Put for it. On it. Facebook page. Okay. All right. You ready? Yep. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. You are here with your Dark Materialists on the final phase of our Golden Compass journey and joined by Travis and Joanna. And Joanna is going to take us on our last recap of this book. I'm very excited. Me too. Here we go. So, after falling asleep by the fire, Lyra is suddenly awakened by Lord Azriel's servant, Thorold, who is trembling and frantic. He tells Lyra that Lord Azrael has kidnapped Roger, and Lyra realizes Lord Azrael is going to cut Roger's demon away in order to harness the loose energy and open a door to another universe. She enlists the help of Yorick Burnison and his bears to track Roger and Lord Azrael across the ice. Suddenly, dozens of witches circle high above and attack the small band of bears. A heavily armed zeppelin carrying Mrs. Coulter also joins the fight. Yorick and Lyra must rush off after Lord Azrael, leaving the remaining Panzerbjorn to keep the witches, Tartars, and Mrs. Coulter's soldiers at bay. Yorick takes Lyra as far up the frozen mountain as he can to a bridge of compacted snow, but it is unable to bear his weight, so he must send Lyra on alone. At the top of the mountain, Lord Azrael works to set up his instruments, pushing away pleading, crying Roger, while Stelmaria clutches Roger's demon in her mouth. Lyra and Pan battle fiercely for their friend and manage to briefly free Roger and his demon, but Stelmaria gets a hold of Roger's demon once more, hindering their escape. In the struggle, the cliff of snow beneath Lyra and Roger gives way. As they fall, Roger is severed from his demon. The burst of energy tears open the sky and reveals the gateway to another world. To Lyra's surprise, Mrs. Coulter appears, and instead of dismissing her, Lord Azriel asks her to come to the new world with him. He tells her that he is going to find the source of dust and destroy it. Mrs. Coulter refuses to come, and Lord Azriel walks away into the other world. Pan convinces Lyra that if Lord Azriel and Mrs. Coulter hate dust, then it must actually be a good thing. She and Pantalaemon decide to go and look for the source of dust themselves. Battling both fear and doubt, they leave Roger's body in the snow on the mountaintop and bravely walk into the sunny new world. And that's the end of the book, The Golden Compass. We're all done. Oh, no. And, uh, well, uh, see y'all next week when we'll... Oh, wait. Are we, we're talking about this one. Okay. I yeah, forgot about that. That's an important part of this. 
So, uh, God, what was your take on these? These were very compact, um, very tightly and carefully written. Mm -hmm. um, what's what's as a if I was a writer, which I'm not, um, I don't even play one on TV. If I was a writer, and like this was the end of my first chapter, there was a time when maybe this would have been a thousand page book, right? Mm -hmm. There's this feels like the most perfect way to end this book it's so open-ended it's not just a cliffhanger it's just the possibilities for a book to you know when you read a first book it lays sort of the groundwork for a trilogy if it's going to be a trilogy or one maybe the existing trilogy that you dive into late or whatever when you read the first book the closure has the end of the book has a certain element to it that has some closure i feel like most first books have some sort of closure this one has no closure this is a wide open this is like a first chapter of a trilogy you know this is so wide open and it takes such a left turn the adventure is going to be so different from this book this is a really standalone piece of this trilogy that we're not going to look back at anymore we are going forward into a new world it's it's kind of astonishing uh, Pullman had to know that this was the first act of yeah. a, of a trilogy. He didn't. This was. There's no way this is self-contained. No. You know, I grew up on. I, I'm I'm an old guy, and I grew up on. You know, the 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 old giant tomes, science sci-fi tomes. You know, yeah. Um, the Tolkien's and the Asimovs and the the Highlines and you know slightly newer with your Douglas Adams and even mm -hmm. newer still your Peter F. Hamilton's. You know, when these guys were like writing like thousand page books you know but this was you know obviously written to to end right where it ended because it had such a perfect ending and beginning all at once when she steps off into the sky i i mean these chapters are like their own mini they have their own mini plot diagram mm -hmm. i mean it's sort you know i mean it starts out obviously you know she wakes up and and you get this exposition tiny bit where you know Thorold starts to explain like what's you know he's gone and he's and then it just, and then there's the rising action you know there's the inciting incident where he takes Roger and then there's the incite you know all the rising action and, and it's building there's the fight which isn't the climax but it's you know it's building and building and building until finally we get to this climax um where Roger is severed and it's and the and the sky opens up and then the falling action is coming down and then it's just this beautiful resolution i mean it's amazing he did in this like two small like what 20 pages they're really uh -huh. really modestly sized yeah yes i mean and, and he just filled there was nothing extra there was nothing filler every ounce of it was necessary and beautiful mm -hmm. and 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 engaging and just and, and i mean there were times where i was in my, on the edge of my seat just like <gasps> you know and he did that in this tiny, tiny bit of space. Yeah. In sports, they call it uh, leaving everything on the field. Like, <laughs> he, it was like there wasn't going to be a next game. Everything he put into this, this end. And, it, yeah, the, the, you know, even this, this battle with, with the bears and the witches and then ultimately the Zeppelin, it's like a climactic battle that yeah. then has a twist where they just walk away in the middle of the battle. Your your protagonists are like, oh, we're oh we're leaving this battle, like oh okay, uh, and that all it's happens so in the epic. Background. Yeah, it's, it's all like happening so in the epic. background. Yeah, it's, it reminds me a little bit of um, you know Shaun of the Dead, where you've got uh, this gigantic <laughs> zombie war, you know, going on, and this little romantic comedy going on right in front of us, and you know th that's what this was. I mean, you've got this the the whole thing with the witches and the bears and everything is getting bigger and bigger like we know this is a, an epic war for you know the souls of humanity but it's still just about this little girl so let's break it down a little bit um so thorold is is frantic at the beginning of this mm -hmm. and and we believe at this point that that azrael has left with roger relatively recently right. where maybe he left and then thorold ran right in and woke her up because a little bit later, when when they're in pursuit, uh, Pan is able to fly up and be able to see him ahead of them, like they're okay. catching up to him. And and Yorick is a tremendous runner, obviously. Um, so he he wakes her up. He tells her what what's going down. A little bit of 
Captain Exposition here about explaining all the things that are happening. But Lyra's, um, this is that cathartic moment where she realizes too late that the thing that she thought she was doing was slightly askew of what really she what she was really doing delivering roger not delivering the alethiometer is what she learns in this moment and and has a, and is very upset by it oh yeah i mean it's the title of the chapter yeah. <laughs> i That's mean real. you know what i mean it's the title of the chapter mm-hmm. yeah. um but go ahead travis i don't want to cut oh off. no 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 please 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 I, I i just i find this this part her realization is just like I'm trying to think of other times in in literature or or watching a movie when the protagonist comes to that realization, realizes the thing that they thought was right was wrong, and the toll it takes on them. And I can I just I love this part in the book. Can I just read it quickly? Please, it's not it's do. not long. Yeah. Um, she said, "Oh, the bitter anguish." She had thought she was saving Roger, and all the time she had been diligently working to betray him. She shook and sobbed in a frenzy of emotion. It couldn't be true. Like, just realizing, like, every single thing I've done, which was to protect him, was, was all, brought him here. Mm-hmm. And it's like that guilt again from, from, I almost, you know, I'm wondering if it's that same guilt she felt then for having brought um, Yorick you know, that, that kind of thinking, and now she has that again with, with Roger, maybe. Uh-huh. I hadn't made the connection between the, the York uh, incident and, and, and this. That's, that's really good. She's, she's carrying so much weight here. Um, she's feeling the burden of being the protagonist of this story. Uh, and the unwitting protagonist in many ways, where she's this de- she's destined to be doing X, Y, and Z. And this feels very much like one of those tasks that she had to not know she was going to do. She never would have delivered Roger. Right. But, right. you know, we don't know for sure because we're just fin- finishing this book, but opening the pathway, the gateway, the bridge to another world is important. This is what has to happen, even at the cost of losing Roger, which we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, it's she's frantic. Um, she wants to get she wants to really get moving and try to save him, but she's also in anguish. She has to yeah. motivate herself. Yeah, yeah. I just love how Yorick doesn't ask. He asks just the right questions, or just the right amount of questions, enough to get going, mm-hmm. not enough to put any additional weight on her but just enough to, to get her to where she needs to be. I kind of had a funny image in my mind of him, like kind of buried in snow. She's like, Yurik, Yurik. And then just like a mound of snow moves and he just pops up out of it because <laughs> yeah. he's been asleep. He slept through everything. You know, it's like, man, that guy can sleep. Oh, uh, but I you love can, like, the way eyes she... open up behind right. some snow. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause it talks about like the, the helmet. Like he's yes, just kind of like, see the helmet, the slits. Yeah. And he pops <laughs> up. Like, it's very like, funny. But what she says to call him, I, I love how oh, he is yes. so, I mean, it broke my heart. She says, you're it, come because I need you. Mm-hmm. And, my, and that's my all she had. or something, yes, my dearest or something, yeah. Yeah, and that's all she had to say. And he was up and out and ready. And it, it, and it was just such a, you know, and it was what she needed because I'm sure at that point she felt the lowest that she's felt. Mm-hmm. thus far. It's, I mean, the, she's so frantic, she can't even dress herself. She yells at Thorold. She's like, get me dressed, you know. Yeah, she can't even do it. And I think riding, what's neat is, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and riding Yurik to her is so second nature, and the way she rides with him is like they're they're really they really are connected. You know, right. I'm glad you said that because that's a uh, that's a good segue. It reminds me of you know a couple of chapters ago when she lied and said that she was uh, Yurik's demon. When more and more, that's really what she's become. I mean, she really has mm-hmm. just, I mean, from their connection, their, 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 their personal connection, just to the physically, the way she, she rides him. I mean, for all intents and purposes, she is. 
when she's crossing the snow bridge, she's pulling herself away uh-huh. from him. She doesn't want to leave him, but mm-hmm. she has to. And he stands on the other side as she moves further and further away from him. There really is a demon element to that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. So they, th- let's touch on this battle a little bit. This kind of surprise battle where the witches attack, which Lyra is, is also uh, disappointed in because I think, I think she would like to think that the witches were all on her side, right? Right. Uh, but n- who is on whose side? Like, who is, what is Azriel's side of this? Do we even know what the sides are yet? It's, it's, I mean, we so don't. there's many different sides. And the witches have these, you know, they have their reasons for doing what they're doing, um, at assisting Azriel or assisting Mrs. Coulter or whatever. This feels like they're assisting Mrs. Coulter, not Azriel. Mm-hmm. But then we see later that there's witches helping Azriel too. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a you know a Doc Brown uh, uh, witch that's up in the lightning with the wire. You know, <laughs> um, so sorry, I pictured him. <laughs> what, what, what Except a wants? woman. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so they're attacked by witches, and. Lyra's kind of out in the open. She could be hit at any moment. Yurik goes back. He gets his bears ready to fight. They get the the fire. What is it? The fire thrower. Fire thrower. Yeah. They yeah. set up the fire thrower, which is like a trebuchet or something mm-hmm. that throws, you know, ash and fire into the air. And they get to work. A, not afraid of anything. B, the witches, the way they fight is very lopsided toward the bears the way they fight because mm-hmm. the witches have to kind of dive in order to be accurate with their bow and arrow and the bear the bears just stand up and like swipe at them i think they take out three right away but then the 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 battle turns a little bit when lo and behold the zeppelin shows up that has a machine gun on the front of it right even then yurik's like ah the bullets just bounce off of this right. let me just uh, point out bulletproof bears Bulletproof. It's true. Yeah. It's true. I, I, it reminds me of like 300. Like, yeah. it, it, you know, there's this small band of bears mm-hmm. and then they get into this formation. Like, I, I love that. Like, as soon as they, they, they're, they're not face at all. And you're right, Alaric. They're just kind of like, oh, bears. And they get into this weird little formation. I keep thinking of like when they got into that little, you know, thing in, four, in 300 when they got yes. in that little formation. And then they just they go right at it like they they already had a plan because they've done this before and mm-hmm. and the witches even though they've smoothly moved into fighting they're a little vulnerable because they can't shoot accurately unless they get close and, and they're then unarmored when, they have their yes. protection so then Which when I, they're close the bears can mm-hmm. swipe I found that a little bonkers I mean they've got the the ultimate range weapon I mean not the ultimate range weapon actually the first ranged weapon the the bow and arrow. And they're coming in close. They have to come in close to shoot the bears. I, I, guess I didn't if quite you were understand f- that. Fighting like an armored bear, you have to find the very specific spots on their armor to be able to pierce. If you were, if they were just shooting at humans, for example, mm-hmm. they could probably just spray arrows. Right. But fighting bears, you have to get close to mm-hmm. target their their more vulnerable areas. Right, because mm-hmm. even the even when the when Mrs. Coulter's zeppelin comes, and the bullets, and it really freaks Lyra out. Yorick's like. Pff bullets like that's not no big yeah even though they could easily kill lyra his charge you know so you know he's not that worried about her i guess Uh, what is that it's like little bull oh yeah that's right can't pierce armor with little bullets little bullets i love that (laughs) i mean any how big would the bullet have to be for yurik to think it was a big bullet because he's very big (laughs) (laughs) so joanna just want to point out though now that you uh, made that 300 reference yorick sounds like uh gerard butler in my head <laughs> so, so <sorry. laughs> this is Svalbard. oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah and, and the, the that sort of the way they put together the the fire hurler um mm-hmm. at which again i was sort of why are they dragging this thing around you know it's it's like seems sort of a it's sort of keeps them from being as mobile as they would like to be but sure enough they needed it and then they have hot pitch at the ready to just throw in the thing and shoot into the air pretty yeah. tremendous yeah that's amazing. don't don't question the bears bears know what they're doing they are for one, bear tattoo bear tattoo travis i'm feeling it pretty killer right happen 
with the big yeah oh it'd be so good um in the midst of this battle um with the zeppelin coming upon the course we all know zepp how zeppelins are powered and what's inside of the gas bag they are able to puncture this bag and the thing basically explodes or ignites mm. but not so much that it kills everybody on board sort of surprised me a little bit a lot of people walk away from that unscathed the only thing i could kind of picture and maybe maybe you guys can elaborate on this the the Zeppelin must have been very close to the ground at this point, right? Yeah. In order right. to be sort of fighting the way it was fighting. So the the little gondola inside of it must have been close to the ground where they just ran out of it when the thing caught fire. Uh, because they they don't seem to lose anyone in that fight or in that in that moment, but they're all grounded at that point. But not grounded so much they can't yank the gun out of the gondola mm -hmm. and start using it on the ground. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was an insane, that was an insane part to me. Like, you know, because of course the, the first thing I thought of was like the Hindenburg, just because, of course. Yeah. you know, and, and I'm thinking how would they have gotten, but you're right, they would have had to have been closer, but then they just, I mean, who recovers from that that quickly? You know, they were just like, they pulled Tartars. out the gun. Yeah, and they just, and then that's it. It's, it's Tartars, it's bears, it's witches, it's, you know, this machine gun and it's, it's this craziness. And then they're like, we ABC, uh, they we just, go. they just walk away. You know, uh, Yurik is confident in his bears skill mm -hmm. to be able to fend off whatever they need to fend off, or at least hold them back for long enough for Elira and Yurik to get to the point where they need to get. And he's ready to leave them. Lyra is his first priority really at this point. Which is kind of incredible, considering he just became the king. These are his like he's his been bears. for what ye for years at least. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know these bears personally, but he trusts them to to handle their business. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, they they do. They know what they're doing. Clearly, do. Yeah, yeah, but his his love for her is greater. Yeah, Ly Lyra is sad. I love it because in here it says, you know, Lyra could feel his desire to be among them. Like she wanted mm -hmm. to stay, but, yes. and this is where that demon connection comes into, right? Mm -hmm. That psychological, emotional connection. He knew how important it was to her. And even though he desired to stay, he went where he knew and, and did what she needed. And, and it was, you know, it's, it was a pretty amazing act of love. Like mm -hmm. love and sacrifice. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Just sort of committing to that. So they leave the battle and they head toward. They they continue to follow Lord Azrael's sledge's tracks up the mountain. Feels like we're getting higher and higher. The altitude is higher and higher, and this ultimate destination has got to be pretty high and pretty cold. Yeah. Um, at what point does she see? So they get across. They, they get to the sort of weakened part of. There's a uh, a bridge that Azrael clearly had just gone across with his sledge, but it supported him. But he had sort of weakened it by crossing it. Mm -hmm. And Lyra and Yorick come upon this, and Yorick and she realize she has to go across herself. Whether it certainly wouldn't hold Yorick, and the chances that it will hold Lyra are small. I think they both think that she might be able to get across it, but they're not sure. Pan goes to the other side and waits for her, but ready to leap to her if she falls. Hmm. Did you catch that where she, he would j jump to her if she fell? And I think I felt like that was so she, they would hold each other as they fell to their death. Well, well you know, fast forward to uh, to Roger Ugh. and his fall and his demon couldn't. Mm -hmm. So we know the 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 connection between the demon and the human can stretch until it breaks. Mm hmm. And I think that's what, uh, you know, Pan, Pan knew that if she fell, he had to be with her. Mm -hmm. You know, he had to be with her or else their connection would be broken. Mm -hmm. Right. And they said, they said chapters and chapters back, never, never, right. never, never. Like never, they had never, already never. made, yeah, they had already made that sort of like a blood pact, you know, like I will never let anybody or anything do this to us. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, like they go down together or they don't go down at all. Yep. Mm -hmm. So they, she does get across. She does have to jump at the last second, but yeah. thank goodness she makes, she does make it. And, you know, Pan is very happy about it. He's got his claws kind of dug into her. Um, 
and they continue their journey to the top of this mountain where they see Lord Azrael at work. They see Stelmaria holding Roger's demon in her mouth. Mm-hmm. And Azrael, Roger is sort of begging Lord Azrael to kind of let his demon go. But Azrael's just sort of continuing to work and just pushing him over. Lyra, I think, is seeing this as she's approaching um, and calls it out to him. But she, I think she's kind of putting it all together here. This is where it all feels real to her. And the aurora goes out. She sees a beautiful aurora, and it goes. It completely goes out. She sees that there's a wire running into the sky, which a witch is holding. Um, there are instruments and batteries on the sledge instruments that appear to be something that Lord Azrael has been working on for some time. This is the device. This is something that, this is his dark materials, the first version of it. Um, Azrael's dark materials is to tear open this pathway into another world. And Roger is the the key. Roger is the, the, the way that he's going to make this happen. It- I'm just trying to imagine Azrael's state of mind at this point. Do you know what I mean? Like when, when Thorold wakes Lyra up, he's like, I've never seen him in this state. I've never seen Azrael in this state. He's beside himself. He's frantic. He's like, you know, super hyper focused and, and it scares him, which is why one of the reasons he wakes Lyra up and up on the top of that mountain, he is just, if ever he was, cold or calculated or you know unfeeling towards Lyra he is a million times over this way now with with Roger this part broke my heart because Roger is pleading and and grabbing and Azrael is just br- literally just brushing him aside I mean it's not mm-hmm. even that he's like no passion like there's not even anger or he's just like like he was just this annoyance and was brushing him aside and he's crying and it was it's meaningless it was just, to him. Yeah, he has was, no connection to him. He does not care. He has one task and one mm-hmm. duty. He's doing one thing. Thorold, as you were saying, Joanna, uh, he's he's been almost in a delirium since she went to bed. I've never seen him so wild. He's lost his. No, he's nuts. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it, par, part of him. Yeah, in my head, I saw him as. Uh, like Dr. Frankenstein, you know, when uh, he's trying to get mm-hmm. work the wheels and the yes. levers mm-hmm. as he's bringing down the lightning to bring the monster to life. That was uh, Azrael to me. Mm. That That's how I saw that uh, take, taking place. And, I, you know, I saw Roger pulling him and then just, again, offhandedly just na- knocking him aside so he could continue his, his work. If you had spent that much time putting together this experiment to create this passageway and you're missing one ingredient and you've just been sitting around waiting for that ingredient you know Thorold talks about how he has a way of getting things that he wants Uh he he asks for them and they arrive but getting a child nobody's going to bring him a child probably not voluntarily and how do how does the how do the armored bears even get a hold of a child but one is delivered to him he has his final ingredient he's driven into a, a frenzy because it's, he's ready. It, he has everything ready. It's been waiting for this one thing, and now he has it. But what, I wonder, though, if he could have gotten a child in some other way, and this had just happened early? I don't because know. He's I ready, mean, remember, though. Remember the, the Turks who um, were just you know kidnapping kids off the street, streets of London to um, for extra cash? He, I, I guess, how does he communicate with the regular world? It seems to always have to go through the bears. They're sort yeah. of moving things back and forth. I don't know that he's has, had human visitors so much. Maybe he has. Mm-hmm. Um, he's certainly not going to be able to get kids from Bolvanger, or not, not before it was destroyed, because right. he and Mrs. Coulter are at, are at odds about what the purpose of this is, what dust is and what they need to do, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. But the that sort of cavalier attitude toward Roger begging him for mercy and not him not getting any, uh, you sort of feel like it's a foregone conclu- conclusion what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, the, that's, that's how the chapter begins. Uh, you know, that's how betrayal begins, which is 
he has this way. And when Thorold said that, I was like, what is he talking about? He has a way of getting what he wants. He just has to call for it. And, and I was like, what, is, what are they saying? Like, what are they saying he can do? Like, he, he can call on the fates, you know, in some kind of way. And, and they will. In a mystical way. Yes, in a mystical yeah. way. And, and then the, and it, you know, give him what he wants. But then it says here, and, and I love this. It's, um, it said, this is why he cried out when um, he was asking for a child. And he freaks out. You know, now we realize he freaks out because he thought the fates had brought him his own daughter. And once he realized, you know, that's why then he relaxed a bit when he saw Roger, because he realized, Oh no, he did like, you know, they brought me. Two. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't have to do that. But, but I think this reminds me very much. And I was telling my Travis about this a little bit, a couple days ago, this is very much, I was waiting for like an Abraham and Isaac kind of story here. Like uh -huh. if, if it were Lyra, I think he would have done it in a heartbeat. You, do you know I, what I mean? agree with that. It, he would have been. You, you don't picture. You wouldn't picture necessarily him just like pushing Lyra over as she pled for mercy. There would be, mm -hmm. especially the way he's with with Marissa later mm -hmm. with with Mrs. Coulter. It's uh, he, he does have. It's a cold and frozen heart, but he does have a heart. Mm -hmm. he, he does. He has had relationships. I think he does care about Lyra a little bit. Um, not as much as some other things, but it's certainly it's still his daughter, regardless of mm -hmm. this this project that he's working on. So he would be maybe more torn up about it and perhaps it would it would tear him up to do it. But to Roger it's not like nothing, not even a blip right. about yeah. like there's nothing he he's not concerned about it at all. He does not care about this kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I when I thought about it, I was like, it's just like it's like Thanos and the Soul Stone. Like if, yep. if he if he would have had to, if it was only Lyra, it would have just been like Thanos and the Soul Stone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just it would have cost him everything. Yeah, he would have, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're like, exactly. dude, you you don't get to drop a tear. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I was. That's yeah. And and obviously yep. that's not what happens here. But I was just sort of speculating because you know. Yeah. But he's that guy. He is absolutely. He is. Yeah. Yeah, totally he, he doesn't care what the consequences are to this. He has his. This is so. This is so masculine. The stuff that he's doing. <laughs> he doesn't care. He's gonna do whatever he's gonna do. He doesn't care what people say about him. He. It's just this. This thing that just drives me crazy about. About this character, he's just like. Devil may care attitude. Doesn't care. He. He's. Yeah. He's the worst. But what's fun, you know, referring back again to my old guy of fiction, um, he would have been the hero in a book written 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. Like he is a, a pulp hero. He's got except the, for except for killing a kid. I, I don't even like, know. Don't you think I, like just shy of that? Yes, I would agree. He's like a scientist living in the Arctic and it's exciting. He's going to open a bridge to another universe. But the the killing of the kid feels like this yeah. is where Pullman's like, oh, you like this guy? There's no way you can like him after this. He definitely crosses the line. He de absolutely crosses the line. But I mean, in general, that whole larger than life, big character who's uh, you know always pushing uh, the 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 powers that be to to let him do what he wants because he's right. You know, he's like the Doc Savage type hero, mm. and. Um, the, the way he just he came in and claimed another man's wife, you know, I mean, that's that's the kind of guy he is. But he's the villain. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about this whole thing. Pullman takes that archetype and turns it on its head and makes him the bad guy. Well, and it's the antihero. I mean, this is exactly what Milton did. If we're talking, you know, if we want to get mm -hmm. kind of lit, lit nerdy here, which is a little <laughs> bit in my I'll keep it light, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, this is, this is, he took this specifically from paradise lost and, mm -hmm. and Milton's Satan is like, is the first like antihero. And even though he's do, you know, he's falling from grace, he's challenging God, you root for him and mm -hmm. you still, there's a part of you that wants him to succeed or you understand and you empathize. And, you know, if you had to pick the lesser two evils, I guess you'd pick, Azrael over Coulter, 
I guess. I don't know. Well, there's but a certain I... delight that Mrs. Coulter took in watching children right. separated from their demons that mm-hmm. feels maybe a little darker. Mm-hmm. Um, and also her motives are still unclear. At least Azriel has a motive and he's also only going to sever one kid. He's a little reluctant. He's, he's not he's not factory severing people. He doesn't right. have a factory design just to sever and people. Sending kids out in the cold to die. He's yeah. sort of he yeah, it, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, this is apples and apples a little bit because they're exactly. both terrible. Yeah. But like, yeah, Mrs. Culture seemed to revel in it a little bit more than like a person a, a real human being should. And you know, severing Rogers is a means to an end for him. One thing. It's so interesting that you just uh, made that, you know, like not a human being uh, reference. It's like, it, it makes me think of, um, you know, both uh, Lord Azrael and Mrs. Coulter are both, you know, disconnected from humanity, like real humanity. But they've got this daughter who's like the most human, you know. She's and, everything that humanity wants and wants to be or should be. Right, or should be, except for the line. Yeah, but you know, the and I wonder if is... that, I wonder if that's like you know her character's uh, I don't know uh, concession to the the dark sides of her parents, like that's how she's able to turn what she inherited from her parents into something positive. As long as she we don't give her a Twitter account, you know, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so lo and behold, who rolls up on this mess? Don't get me. I don't even want to talk about it. But <laughs> this, you know what, rolls up from the other <laughs> side of the mountain. Clearly, she found another way up. And, you know, I, I wrote here, this is in my notes here, uh, monkey, big cat action. Yes! Um, creepy. They, creepy. They are all up in each other's business. So nasty. Big time. So nasty. It's like it's demon so on nasty. demon. Like, I don't want to see that. No, especially no. with that monkey. Oh, but the monkey's oh. like scratching her belly. Oh. It's like, oh, it's just the worst. Tail so erect. Worst. It's awful. Yes. Yes. It's awful. Yes. It's, it's all awful. around. I felt uncomfortable. I felt like I yes. should have had, like the book should have come to me in, in, in brown paper and I could, you know, like anonymous. Like it was horrible. Oh, yeah. The, the, oh. Yes. This moment feels very much out of the back room of a video store. It's like, For why? Reason. Of course, they had a connection at one time, but the the ease at which they fall back into that relationship, mm-hmm. and the they sort of are delighting in this this frolic, right? And this is also legit after Roger's dead. No, uh, yes. yeah, no, yeah. Roger is stone cold dead, dead. severed. Dead. Lyra's holding him in in her arms. Their daughter is holding a dead dude. A dead yeah. kid. Not even yeah. a dude. A kid. Yeah. And they're Feet up away. there doing that brisness. It was disgusting. I, I was... That's one of those moments where you're like, okay. Like, I'm here for it because it serves it serves a purpose in the plot. But man, was it uncomfortable to read. Yeah. Well, and, and it was just like, I was... You know, it's that tired trope for me. Where I was like, yes, of course. You're going to be like, no, no, no. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I'm like, can't you just like, and for me, that, but I was just, I was like, come on, Marissa. Yeah. You can't just be like, uh, you had, you done had your chance. Yeah. Yeah. No. He was, he's sort of trying to game her a little bit with this exciting adventure this description of what he is this this journey he's going to go on and he's like come with me we'll do this together it's going to be great but she is still so entrenched in the magisterium Mm -hmm. and she still believes them to be right whatever that is i don't know that we really know what the magisterium's role in this is yeah i still do we know what the role of the magisterium is here i I don't think no and i'm going to say that that's a bit of a flaw not a flaw but that is uh, an issue I have with the book. I feel the like first book by, by the time. Yeah. By the time you're done with the first book, I should by the first act of a story. I should know what the stakes are. And yeah. I feel like I don't yet. This would it, it, in a series format. 
that would be something I would pull from the appendices, you know, I would pull from the second book and move mm-hmm. it a little bit into the first part of the yeah. that first first whatever episodes to give you a little bit more. It, the, the Magister, it, it ends up making the Magisterium this kind of like nameless, faceless, big bad that has no ideology motives but we don't know what it is and it is it christian is it not christian is this about god is it about something else it's not clear it's the empire and from star wars it is they're just right. at this point nameless faceless mm-hmm. we've, we've seen we've gotten a couple lord boreal we, there's a couple names but for the most part it's sort of this flat big bad yep. that is not involved in our story yet that no and prob- yet go ahead God. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, they're probably wearing, you know, some kind of fascist uniform. Robe. Or, <laughs> a robe. There's yeah. definitely a robe here. There's robes. There's, there's, there's fascists. There's, there's, there's helmets involved. They meet it's... in smoky chambers and, you know, they, they whisper and one person yells every once in a while. Like, I feel like, yeah, there's a real star chamber element to this. They're very British. It, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Even if they're in Stockholm or wherever the, the, the magisterium. Where, is, where is the seat of the magisterium? Do you? Well, God, that's a long time ago. What well, they say what it is? I just forget. I did. The, it may have been Stockholm, actually. I know it, it was. Stockholm. Yeah, it, I know it was someplace in. It's like, also the, kind of funny because it's a, a you know Sweden is such a polite and lovely, lovely yeah. place. Yeah. <laughs> so they're they, all, well, I just want to say this little thing yeah. because for uh, all of this vagueness, right? The sort of like uncertainty about who the magisterium is. Mrs. Coulter isn't saying no to Azrael because she believes in what they're doing. She's saying no because she said they're too powerful. Like, mm, and that's yeah. a very different answer mm-hmm. than I can't go because I don't agree with you. She's like, they're going to find you. She's like, they're too powerful. And he, you know, and he gets really irritated. You think I don't know that? You, think, you don't think I know what they can do with their power? He's mm-hmm. like, you know that I know. And so, you know, and so she hesitates and she wants to go. Uh-huh. But she's like, I mean, it's basically like, you know, then you'll you'll be on the run. We'll be on the run the rest of our lives. And she can't she can't do it. Mm-hmm. Right. But, so it's weird to me, though, that they're going to give this much power to some kind of an organization or some kind of group that we still don't even know what they're fully about, which is why right. I wanted to. You know what I mean? Because it's just like, well, you're really af- you're afraid of who? Right. Right. Yeah. But she turns him down, you know, even after the kiss. The first kiss, which she wasn't into, and the second kiss, she was a little more into. But she's yeah. still like, you know, I- I'm not down. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then he disses her hardcore. Hard. Yeah. Hardcore. He's just like, girl, come with me now. Or, and like, you know, ABC. Yeah. And she, she's like, I can't. And he's just like, bye. He's like, I won't come back for you. I won't give you another thought. Yeah, this, <laughs> is, your, this is your chance. Oh, yep. my gosh. It was so, it was such a hard diss. I was like, what? Yeah. And then and pan to, cold. you know, it pan is. camera to the left. Here's his daughter <laughs> sitting in the snow with a dead kid. It's still. Horrible. It's horrible. You know, this, so uh, this is Roger's death while upsetting and shocking. And it happens so sort of, this is like an unceremonious death. Oh, I had to read it three times. Oh, no, he got, he, he got that seven. He died. Yeah. He got seven? yeah. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Same. He's dead. Same. You know, there yep. was sort of that like, uh. so when she's laying there. And this is when she and Pan are having this conversation about what to do next. I'm sitting there thinking, man, this is kind of, to me, a little bit of a Dobby death. Dobby, to mm-hmm. me, was like a real low-rent death. Mm-hmm. So you're halfway through the Deathly Hallows. Dobby's dead. And then they bury him in the sand or whatever. Right. I'm like, come on, can we give this cat some more love? This is even lower than that. She just yeah. leaves him in the Left him to in freeze the in the snow. I know. And is he even going to freeze well because that sun is coming in? Mm. He might not freeze so good right. anymore. It's not like Everest. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, that's if it hot, were... hot sun coming mm-hmm. through there. Yep. He's going to be gross in a minute. Yep. So oh. it, it feels very, like, that feels like a desecration a little bit mm. where I understand that, what is she going to do? You know, what is she going to do? She's going to dig, a, you know, it's like, that's not going to happen, but it feels like Roger... Him dying again is so shocking, but quick. And like you said, Travis, you had to read it a couple times. Like, is that, whoa, is it, did that just happen? Mm-hmm. And then he's he's done. He's gone. He isn't even just a shell of a kid. He's dead. Stone yeah. cold dead. 
which is shocking in its own it's in its own right. But Lyra's in despair, of course. She's certainly stunned by all of this. She's pissed off by what her parents are doing, big time. Understandably, Pan is losing his his mind because he sees those demons and he's like, "What is this freaking?" Oh monster? my god! And this is where we see him change. You know, while this is all kind of going on, maybe even before Roger's severed, he's like popping through. This is the most active he's been with changing his form. It's like mm-hmm. pop, 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 pop. he's going through. Pullman mentions, you know, forms that I hadn't even heard him mention before that Pan could do. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all kinds of new things. I think a lion might have been. Did you catch the lion? There's like a lion. He changed to a lion. So Pan sort of, after the Mrs. Coulter turns down Azrael, and then Azrael's like, I didn't want you anyway. And then he walks into the sky and Marissa walks away. I guess she never sees Lyra. Lyra's sort of like down the ridge a little bit. Didn't realize she was there. But Marissa leaves, and it's just Pan, dead Roger, Pan, Lyra, and a gateway to the stars. Pan's like, hey, what's behind us sucks. Other than Yurik Berninson, there's death, there's misery behind us. Everything that we've experienced up to this point has been terrible. There's people behind us that we love, but maybe, maybe if dust, as you said in the in the keynote, maybe dust is a good thing. Maybe it's worth fighting for. And if Azrael and and Mrs. Coulter think it's bad, then it must be good. This is that decision to take a leap of faith, a literal leap of faith in some ways into another universe. Mm-hmm. I was um, a little verklempt here in this moment with her, her, she and he talking about their connection and how important they were to each other and what the next stage in their life was going to be. This is really special. here. This is that moment that carries us into the next book. You know, I wonder is if people in that world have those kinds of conversations with their demons on a regular basis. You know, if they, they explore their relationships with their demons. They must. I mean, it can't be mm-hmm. exclusive to Lyra because they are so important. You know, the the connection between demon and human is so mm-hmm. important. And so important that it can, it turns you into a shell of yourself if you're separated from them. Mm-hmm. There must be some of that throughout the world. I just wonder if it's not a side effect might be the term. Um, of her uh, upbringing at Jordan College. Like, she's mm. a, a bit more introspective, mm. uh, a bit more academic than uh, most people. Because, you know... She and uh, he were alone a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel like, sol- like almost like an only child can mm-hmm. be somewhat more solitary and sometimes be more introverted, but not necessarily socially, but just someone who is a thinker and thinks a lot. That if you had this constant companion, you can imagine what being alone with them in vast halls of books and, you know, just adults that don't pay any attention to you, how much you could have deep, meaningful conversations with your soul. As an only child, I can tell you that, uh, yeah, the the kinds of things that go on in your head (laughs) during those long Mm. moments when you don't have a person with you. You know, if I had a manifestation of that in front of me, oh gosh, I just, I imagine I'd have a lot of those conversations all the time. You may have how little sleep you would get uh, <sighs> if you had to do, you just like, God, you just never stop talking. I mean, I do that already. I just, I have conversations with myself in the bathroom mirror, uh-huh. like all the time. 100%. And sometimes yep. I have like fake arguments in front of the mirror too. Like I'll say the things yes. I thought I should have said and I'm all like, run. Or the things that you that you're worried that you're gonna say, or the things that you think the other person's gonna say. You have those conversations with you. Yes, Yes, I'm not crazy. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, you would have like an ear or two ears to bounce Mm -hmm. that off of. Yeah. Through a test, you could test out your material. Comedians could be much better. (sighs) Yes. (laughs) Your your other half would be like, no, don't do that one. Or no, this is good. This is good. (laughs) Nah, nah, nah. But then he also tells her, and he's, you know, he's such a sharp little guy, like Pan, you know, and this is where I always, this is where I say, I, I just believe that they are very much in, in many ways, their own being. 
And while they're connected, you know, Pan is Pan and Pan has his thoughts and feelings. And, you know, he is just building her back up, you know, like, like he is like, look, we can do this. And she's mm-hmm. like, he's like, we're going to be all alone, but we're going to have each other. And then he's like, and we'll have the alethiometer. You know, like he's like, he pulls in, he's like, we won't have York oh. and we won't have Serafina, but we're going to have each other and we're going to have the alethiometer. And he, you know, and, and, and then she's like, yeah. Yeah, we could look for like she and then she totally comes around. Mm-hmm. He's it's like, amazing. we could ask all the right questions this time. Yes. So she, it's like she, now she's like, you know what? I'm not going to I'm going to ask more questions. I'm not right. going to leave things to chance. I'm going to be asking the alethiometer more questions because many of the things she was that have happened to her. She could have. She could have avoided by asking one extra question to the alethiometer. Yep. Right. But, you know, she just had a belief that this is what she was doing. She's going through this this journey. And why would she ever think her father was waiting for a kid to sever? You know, it's like it just it never occurred to her. Now mm-hmm. she's not going to leave it to chance. She's going to be asking more questions. The alethiometer is going to play a bigger role, I feel like, going forward. Not that it didn't already play a pretty big role, but it's really going to to set the stage as the as the story progresses. Was this the first time that Pan was the the one of the two of them who was uh all come on let's do it let's go because i i I recall pan throughout most of the book has always been kind of lyra let's kind of rethink this but uh this time he's like let's go let's jump into another universe i mean (laughs) if you're if if he ever had to pick a moment to uh to to be that guy he did it just then he witnessed a severing of a child and a demon he's seen things Mm-hmm. You wouldn't believe at this mm-hmm. point. Um, he's changed. He's changed. That has to be it. Absolutely. Just and, like and, she has. And that's the that's the genius and the beauty and the awesomeness of Pullman. That he has, you know, that he, he's able to not only have his human change, characterization, yep. and, and, and but he is able to develop this demon, which is an amazing thing that demons grow and learn and change and can, you know, that's such a cool that's such a cool way of, of, of having them really be fleshed out. You know, they could be very one dimensional. Like Uh Pan could have always been, Oh no, Oh no, Oh no, Oh no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't have, yeah. And it would not have made the same impact, but just like with any static versus, you know, dynamic character, he grew and, and it's, 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 it's awesome. It's really, it's really neat. And he's, he's the other half of our, protagonist so he is in many ways our protagonist Uh he's just the other half of her Uh and he's just as important to us we fear for his safety you know how many times have i been like oh god you know pan you know know, oh don't take that form it's so small and fragile uh he's he's just as important he he you know lyra's the one leading up to this moment that has used her agency to move the plot forward not always not always correctly Mm -hmm. but she's always used that to move forward and at this moment when she's questioning everything that has happened up to this point blaming herself from the moment she left jordan she feels like she's made mistake after mistake after mistake and pan's like kind of pumping her up and let let's do this we can we can make some of this stuff right we can Mm -hmm. we can do something right and good right now Mm -hmm. it's going to be scary it's going to be in it it's going to be it's going to be just you and me we're going to be on our own but we can do this and she's she comes around just like you said they came she came around it kind of reminds me of when uh they're escaping from uh ballvanger and pan is telling uh lyra everything she needs to say to each of the individual kids to get them going yeah, because Pan knows Pan mm-hmm. can read mm-hmm. people well enough to, to to do that. Yeah, he's got some of, you know, they, they, he has some of that personality, some of her personality, too. Yep. Um, I, I had a couple of recap things here. The, the description of the other world was mm-hmm. just mes- just mesmerizing. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't know what that is going to look like in a TV show, but in my head, it's it's. It's awe-inspiring. The, the, yeah. the, the Aurora, to me, that's a bucket list item for me to see the Aurora in my life mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and see it. You know, it's, it's been kind of weak lately because the solar flares, flares are low, mm-hmm. but I want to make sure I go there when it's, like, really popping. 
but this this sky that's just opening it up into a, a city that you can really see and palm trees and water and sun and heat. You could feel the heat. Mm-hmm. It's not just something you're looking at. This is you're really right there next to another another world. It was very striking to me and and, and thrilling to read that description. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. That had a lot of a little that had a lot of pros in it. There was a lot of good pros in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yorick and Lyra. We were you were talking about Lyra's really become his demon in many ways. I just love them as a team. Uh, and if I had one disappointment, I would love to see a whole series of them together. Um, an entire book series with the two of them on adventures together mm-hmm. because he's they're they're so different but the way they play off of each other is is just so wonderful yeah between uh, those two and um weirdly enough um mrs coulter and um Oz- lord Azrael. I'd actually like to see them have their own adventure. I'd like to know what they're like. I said, you know, they rem, it reminds me very much of a pulp hero mm-hmm. and I'd like to see, you know, the two fisted adventures of Lord Azrael and Miss, uh, Mrs. Coulter, yeah. you know, doing whatever they do yeah. in, in ways that don't involve, you know, weird demon things. <laughs> right. Yeah. Weird I, would, demon I, things. I would read, I would read that, but yeah, you know, and, and of course there's the book of dust has uh, like kind of a prequel, Mm-hmm. Um, the first one is kind of a prequel, which we'll eventually get to. Nice. Um, and the second one is a little bit of a sequel. So this, we're going to get some continuation of this trilogy, which I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Awesome. Uh, so uh, the official date, I know I pitched the third, which was partially right. The third in Britain, mm-hmm. in the UK, and we get it on the fourth. Uh, on HBO, which is a Monday. So, man, we are right there. It is the middle of September, guys. In six weeks, we're going to be watching this. So in exciting. a month. A month from yesterday, they're going to see it for the first time in London. Oh, right. It's going to screen. Yes. With Q&A. Right. Yes. yes. We get to, we'll probably get Twitter reactions. It's going to be very exciting. Is there anyone listening listening to this in England? Can, they, can I stay at their house, please? Yeah. I want to go. Yeah, well, I'll come over for this. Maybe we'll get an invite. Hey, if anybody's involved in the His Dark Materials <laughs> series and wants Travis, myself, and Joanna to come and, like, I don't know, be their plus threes, we are down like clowns. I'll dress like as a clown if you want me to. <laughs> Most of my clothes are like our clowns. I was going anyway, three quarters. So. I knew, I knew you were going there. I'm like, I'm three quarters there already. Okay. All right. We're on the same page there. Uh, so that's coming up very quickly, and, and we're very excited about that it's uh uh, yeah six weeks i'm ready let's do it yes any other uh hot takes uh gosh no i I mean we're done with the book i'm a little uh a little overwhelmed Mm -hmm. that that we're through the book only took 10 episodes to do this uh so next week the movie huh the movie we're gonna check out the new line cinema movie from 2007 which did win a couple oscars for yeah, special too. effects mm. uh, and nothing else. And uh, we're going to take a deep dive into that. I've seen it recently. I watched it with my daughter and um, she loves just hearing her name over and over again. So that was part of it. Uh, <laughs> but I uh, will dive into that. And we're trying to get some guests on. We're shooting to get some guests on um, mm. for the next episode. So hopefully we'll get to make that happen from uh, some of our sister podcasts. We'll see if we can finally pull that together. And... Um, I've just, just let me interject on that one. I have yeah. yet to hear from any of them. But if anyone's listening and they'd like to be on the podcast, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Travis Johnson. Super easy. Or... Um, you can get me on uh, Facebook. I also have a uh, Travis Johnson uh, on there, and it's the Travis Johnson looks like me, so you should be able to find it pretty easily. Um, and then you can uh, email me at uh, a different address that I'm not going to put on the show. <laughs> uh, well, I, I did I did hear back from one. Um, we've been sort of reaching out separately, but the His Dark Materials podcast, I did reach out, and they were 
interested, so we're going to try to figure out the date and put that together. I think it's fantastic. Uh, yeah, so awesome. we'll, we would love to to talk to them as well. I think they actually think they are in the UK, are they not? If it's the one I'm thinking, I, I, I think so. Yeah. so. I mean, they have accents. That doesn't necessarily mean they're in the UK, but <laughs> I could Maybe they're assume. faux accents. Maybe they just do it. For them. They're from Brooklyn or someplace. They're from down, you know, down the road from there. <laughs> we should do an episode all in British accents. <laughs> oh. Just, just, oh, God, how bad would that be? It would be I so mean, terrible. Oh, God. Oh, no. The Dick Van Dyke episode. Of the, the, Lin, <laughs> the, the, the Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda episode. <laughs> We love you, Lynn. We love he you. He listens to we this. Do. He's got to hate us. Yeah. Oh my no, gosh. he's going to love us. We love him. We love yes, Lynn. Do we love do. him. Yeah. We do. Uh, so, but, we have, uh, so we have a, our marching orders for next week. We're going to watch the film. We're going to yeah. review it and talk about it and talk about the, the ups and downs of it. I do have a little bit of homework for you two. Okay. Ooh. So before we, after you watch the movie next week, I would like, I'm going to send you a link, but I'm going to describe the link here. The... Golden Compass had a video game attached <laughs> when it was released. And that video game, when you completed it, had footage that was not put in the film of the final moments of this book, the correct ending <gasps> with what? the with the Sitagaze opening up in the sky. Uh, so I'm going to send it over to you. It's it's someone did a someone worked very hard. I didn't work hard on this, but someone worked very hard and put together uh, fan art and and drawings from the book and the graphic novel and uh, audio from the audiobook mixed in with the um, cut cutscenes. Ooh, it's pretty great, and it'll be interesting to talk about it in relation to the way they kind of messed with the the story and the movie. Awesome. So uh, please do check that out. Your minds are going to be blown, first of all. And then you're going to be like, man, yeah, somebody pulled the plug on this at some point. It's going to be one of those big disappointments. Uh, so, speaking yeah. of fan art, um, I am collecting fan art um, because, as some of you may know, I have started posting the show on YouTube. Our first episode is up right now. And um, I'd like to have little uh, montages of images that go along with our audio on shows where you don't get to see our faces. So um, if you have fan art, if you find fan art, feel free to shoot those over to me, too, on Twitter. Oh, please do. That'd be great. And I, I think that Travis particularly wants one of the leopard tents crouching with her claws just pretching in the golden monkey's flesh and the monkey relaxed, blissful, swooning in the snow. Uh, uh, I was desperate to never uh, hear that again. Uh, uh, oh, God, some sorry. Demon, yeah, how about some demon on demon fan art? Uh, just for yeah. Travis. Devastating. Uh, all right, so uh, appreciate you guys listening. Um, please email email us at uh, feedback at theamberspycast dot com. Uh, I am Alaric, and I am Travis, and I am Joanna, your dark materialist, signing off for this week. Take care, guys. Bye. Have a good night. <laughs>